Hey, everybody. How are you all? Good. Everybody good? OK. Nice to see your faces here today. Uh, my name's Jenny Mack. I'm from here in Fort Worth, Texas, uh, born and raised. I, I'm a musician here. I started playing as a kiddo. Um, started with classical music when I was seven years old. And one day, my nana and I were walking through the forest stockyards, and we heard music at the end of the train station and walked down there to see what was going on. And there were all these people in Western clothing, had guitars and fiddles and you know the big double bass. And they're playing what, to my mind, was just country music. So it turned out that they had a club called the, it was a club called the Cowtown Opry. And they had a children's club. So you could sign up and be mentored and learn music. And I, I said, this is so great. This is country music. And she said, no, 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 this is Western swing music. So this was the first time I'd ever heard it. And from 12 years old on, I've just been an enthusiast and a fan and um, a player of this music and a friend to this music. So I'm really happy you're all here. I'd love to share what I know and what I've learned and share some stories and some funny anecdotes with you. So hope you're all ready. All right, here we go. Sorry. Okay, okay so just to give you a little bit of an overview, this little series is chronological. So today we're covering all of this sort of early Western swing, so kind of the 20s to the 40s, its influences, how it got going, and some of the major band leaders and musicians from that era. Um, next week, I'll get a little bit more detailed. I might go into some sidemen and some stories, uh, definitely focusing on some of the musicians that are right here in Fort Worth, and then also go into the later period in the 50s. Um, in the third session, we'll kind of talk about the Western swing resurgence. So you've probably, maybe you've heard that like George Strait, Willie Nelson, Merle Haggard, Asleep at the Wheel, these bands were doing, you know, some of these big names in country music were doing Western swing music, as well as, you know, a bunch of hippies from New Jersey, Asleep at the Wheel, playing Western swing music, which was super cool. <laughs> in the very last session, we'll go into the genre, sort of what's happening with it now, where it's headed, some of the artists that you might hear about right here in Fort Worth and all over. OK, so I know that sometimes we, we love to make something and we go, oh, I can make session one, but not session two. So that is OK. It will be archived. I think the, that the library is going to have archives. And I also have started a little site specifically for this course, if anybody wants to write that down. So every time after this session, I'm going to go ahead and upload what was covered today, so you'll have access to the PowerPoint, and maybe any songs that we heard, as well as some fun additional resources and points of interest for you. So feel free to follow that. I'll also have a link to it on my website, which is just JennyMack.com. OK, let's get going so that we can start listening. <laughs> OK, so what on earth is this music? So like I was saying, it's not country music. Um, it came about during the Great Depression era. So this was, this was string music. This was hillbilly music. A lot of the melodies derived from the old world, old folk melodies, from African-American blues melodies. So you might hear something, you know, you've got to figure, even just in Texas, we have a lot of, we have Czech populations, we have German populations. So many of those melodies were appearing in these Western swing bands. They were learning them, and they were adapting them for their bands. So that's kind of an early overview of where it came from. There's a really strong Fort Worth home base here. So we'll definitely get into Crystal Springs Dance Hall and what that was all about. But have you all ever eaten at Heim Barbecue on White Settlement Road? OK, so if you're at Heim and you look across the road to the other side of the river, that was the site of Crystal Springs Dance Hall, which sadly burned down in the 60s. But a uh, whole lot of shaking went on there. OK, so as you can see here, <laughs> it's wild to think of it as such a hodgepodge. Fiddle breakdowns, country ballads, blues, jazz, ragtime swing, pop, polka, shadishes. It's almost like they just said, let's take every single musical genre, maybe other than rap, because it didn't exist yet, <laughs> and throw it in. So it is a beautiful blend. OK, and of course, it is dance music. It was sort of centered around this idea of playing and picking for the dancers. OK, let's see. OK, again, we'll definitely do some listening here in just a hot minute. But some of the features that came about 
you definitely um, hear the, the twin fiddle sound. So playing in these beautiful harmonies, that's a really key element of Western swing music. The steel guitar doing all these kind of fun, snippy little licks. Um, definitely a driving rhythm and walking bass lines. So this is what, we're definitely gonna get into this. When you have the sort of traditional fiddle breakdown music, it's a very different rhythm from more of the the swing or even the lopier swing that came from the blues. And so we'll, we'll listen to some differences there after a bit. Another thing that was added was the piano. The piano became a really huge part of the rhythm section. And you didn't find that in the sort of hillbilly string bands. Again, the African-American blues and jazz influence. So this came about during the world wars. Um, this was something really interesting. I actually just did a presentation for Fort Worth Sister Cities on um, a similar element here. But early, early, World War I through World War II, you had a lot of soldiers, African-American soldiers that were in the South, they were being shipped to Europe. So you had this amazing phenomenon of sometimes Western swing artists were recording the exact same songs as French jazz artists across the pond. And the, the link there were the um, African-American soldiers, and they were introducing them to these really amazing blues and jazz rhythms and jazzy licks that they hadn't ever experimented with before. And so, oh, what was it? Um, oh, we'll get to that in a minute. Actually, that's coming later, okay. So we're gonna today talk about some of the just early, early key figures. So we're gonna hear about the Light Crust Doughboys, Milton Brown and the Musical Brownies, Bob Wills and the Texas Playboys, and Spade Cooley. All right. Okay, the Light Crust Doughboys. So they were formed in the early 30s. Um, they started out as a string band. It was two guitars, a fiddle, a vocalist, very minimal. And they kind of got this gig doing advertisements for the Burris Mill right in Saginaw, Texas. So they were headed up by um, Pappy Leo Daniel, and he was, he was very you know, overzealous about this. He really loved having the musicians go to promote the Burris Mills, and they would write these kind of snappy little songs in order to promote them. It started out Milton Brown, Bob, Wills, Herman Arnspeiger, and Derwood Brown. Again, they were mixing that sort of early fiddle music, and they had this, this jazzy little influence that was happening. Um, later on, of course, they ended up disbanding over some disagreements with Pappy Leo Daniel. So he became their MC, and he also wanted them to work in the mill. So you can imagine. <laughs> You can imagine this didn't go over well. They really enjoyed, you know, they could ride around in, in the van. They were projected out <laughs> through the streets playing music. They, they didn't mind doing that. They enjoyed doing that. But he also wanted them to work for $7.50 a week playing music and then also work in the mills. And I read, it said, Wills drove the truck, Arnspeiger worked the dock, and Brown was in sales. And they were just none too happy with this. They wanted to play music. They were very successful at it. Um, but eventually, they had some disagreements with him over money. They wanted to be paid more. And Pappy Leo Daniel didn't want to go for that. So they disbanded and went on to do their own things. Now, I wanted to pull up this song. This is not the Light Crust Boys. But this song, we were just talking about this. This is the Easy Ride and Papa. So this is a version of it by Milton Brown and the Musical Brownies. But this was a tune that Brown and uh, Wills had written some lyrics over. Where, what did you say the original title? The original song was very, very deep southern black. Mm -hmm. Eagle Riding. I couldn't remember the first word. It was Eagle Riding Papa. And they wrote lyrics as Easy Riding Papa. <laughs> and they used this as their theme song. There's everybody from New York, if you want to know who we are, you need to write something from Tennessee. If you like the way we play, listen while we try to say, you need to write something from Tennessee. And on that long, the 
something kind of special about sharing a 78 with somebody because you know I, I it's great we have streaming music at our fingertips but with a 78 you just get this one song <laughs> here you go <laughs> all right okay moving right along musical uh, Milton Brown and the musical brownie so we just heard a little from them, but I wanted to play this one also as a little special note. I read somewhere that this song, the St. Louis Blues, was the first tune that Milton and Bob and Herman had ever played together before they were the Lycris Doughboys. So they met randomly and they just had a jam session and decided to start playing some music together. So again, this is Milton Brown, but that's a pretty special thing. That's how a lot of bands get started. <laughs> Oh, 
Okay, just want to play a little of that one for y'all. The St. Louis Blues. And also that really great guitar solo by Bob Dunn. We'll get to him in a moment. <laughs> All right. So they kind of came about in 1932. So remember the Doughboys, they, they were all pretty disillusioned with O'Daniel and they went their own ways. And Milton Brown and Bob Wills went on to do some different things. But Milton Brown um, was right here in Fort Worth, Texas. He's known as the father of Western Swing. So all of his sort of early experimentation and his group playing here at Crystal Springs, they really just honed their craft and, and they were trying out some completely different wild things that had never been done in this, you know, this, this music was, was forming right before their eyes. So some of these early members, you can see Milton and Durwood, Brown, uh, Wana Kaufman on bass, O.C. Stockard uh, played the banjo and I actually got to know his son. His son's name was Donald Stockard, and he was a trumpet player. And I played a few times with him, and he was a very nice, quiet man and talked a lot about his father. Uh, Jesse Ashlock and Cecil Brower are both fiddle players, and Papa Calhoun, who was a piano player. So Fred Papa Calhoun was an early innovation. So the piano became a huge part of the rhythm section and also as a soloist. So they were doing these Saturday night broadcasts from Crystal Springs Dance Hall that were phenomenal. So this hall was bringing in, you know, a thousand people or more on Saturday nights. They only did broadcasts on Saturday nights, but they were bringing a lot of people. And it said, Crystal Springs Dance Hall, dancing and swimming. <laughs> so you could, you know, there was the water right there, right? But anyhow, um, so really wonderful place. And actually I'm gonna get a little further into Crystal Springs here in a moment, but, um, they had a very short-lived career. It was only a few years because Milton Brown was killed in a car accident right on Jacksboro Highway. If you know where the Avalon Motel is, right around there was where he died. And it was a little spooky because only a couple of months before that, he had just recorded the song Avalon. So I wanted to pull that up for a moment. My love in Avalon beside the bay. I left my love in Avalon and sailed away. I dream of her and Avalon from dusk till dawn. And so I think I'll travel on to Avalon.
again, I wanted to kind of highlight what you were hearing there. You could hear the twin fiddles playing Avalon. You heard Bob in the background. So they were doing this kind of call and response, which, um, which they really brought to this music from, again, these early influences from African-American blues and jazz. Um, Bob Dunn, just a really kind of early jazz musician in this genre, he was just out there. He played, he played some pretty wild stuff um, that was not just like a traditional fiddle music. And um, I was really happy. I found a 78 that I had been looking for because I think that taking off, it's a little instrumental, but it's just, I'll play a little bit of it. But you can really kind of get the sense of what he was bringing to the music. Well, so one other really interesting thing, Bob Dunn was also known to be one of the one of the very first amplified instruments on stage. And so I think that, um, I mean, I imagine that was kind of a spectacle, but for sure they were, they were blending it though with things that were familiar to people. So they weren't being 100% completely out there experimental. You had these lovely melodies, the twin fiddles playing the waltzes and the swing. And then you, you kind of get this wild card like Bob Dunn. And, and I think that, I mean, to, to me, that would be really fascinating. But I think that it, probably they were blending enough of what was familiar and what was new to make them sort of hot on the scene. And so, Speaking about that, we're getting into a little bit about Crystal Springs Dance Hall. So again, right over there off of White Settlement Road, 5336 White Settlement Road to be exact. I think it's under construction now. They're probably building like a Froyo or something, but either way, it's Western Swing Holy Ground. <laughs> so the very early site of popular dances, a thousand people or more on Saturday nights, hosted many of these early artists that we're talking about. I've included some photos that you could, guys can kind of get the feel of it. 50 cents per couple, did you see that? I love that. All right, so every Saturday night they're broadcasting live and I included this little bit about Bonnie and Clyde. So there's this sort of amazing folklore that um, Bonnie and Clyde popped in there sometimes and would also listen to the broadcast. So in the words of Roy Lee Brown, after the Brownies began broadcasting from the Springs, Bonnie and Clyde also listened to broadcasts on the radio in their car. Musician J.B. Brinkley recalled in Gary Jinell's Milton Brown and the Founding of Western Swing, Clyde Barrow had an old Ford, which had a radio in it, and they always listened to Milton's broadcast when they were in town. Clyde's favorite tune was My Mary, and he'd call Crystal Springs and get Papa Sam on the phone and say, Hey, Pop, tell old Milton to play My Mary and dedicate it to you know who. He'd never say who it was, but Pop knew his voice. Milton would go on the air and say, okay, here is my Mary, and we want to dedicate it to you know who. Brinkley's father was J.B. Blackie Brinkley, a bouncer at Crystal Springs in the early 30s. J.B. Brinkley recalled, we didn't have a car, but my daddy knew all he had to do was walk to the corner of University and 7th Street and stand there, and before long, someone would drive by he knew, and they'd say, hey, J.B., you going to Crystal Springs? Get in. Well, this one time, here comes Bonnie and Clyde. She was driving, 
and he was in the passenger side with a machine gun on his lap. They were going real fast, but they stopped when they saw my dad. They knew each other, so Bonnie slams on the brakes and she leans out and says, hey JB, you going to Crystal Springs? And he said, yeah. And she goes, well, we're a little hot right now, but you're welcome to ride with us if you want to. He looked down in there, saw the machine gun, and waved them on. No, I think I'll wait for somebody else. Thanks just the same. You go ahead. <laughs> he writes, the dance hall developed a reputation being a rough place, especially when word got out that Bonnie and Clyde were regular dancers. There was always an abundance of fist fights at Crystal Springs, but never a report of a killing. <laughs> <laughs> so after Milton Brown had passed away, um, it mentions here that the attendance had kind of declined. And just to get into the future of it, in 1963, it became Ray Cheney's Stagecoach Inn. They continued to host bands, but a fire burned the club down in 1967. I, I kind of walked those grounds one day because I was hoping to find something, you know, like a burned out ticket stub or whatever, but no, it's all, it's all been gone. But it is a wonderful uh, thing that existed there at one time. <laughs> All right. Oh, I do want to mention that we have a special guest today, and he is here. <laughs> this is my brother, Glenn McLaughlin. So feel free to, uh, you can just take a seat for a bit and relax. <laughs> All right, moving right along, we're going into Bob Wills and the Texas Playboys. So Bob Wills was born in Cossie, Texas. Now, if you're looking at a map, it's, it's like, here we are, and here's Waco, and it's kind of right out here, okay, <laughs> if that makes any sense. <laughs> but he did spend a lot of time, I think when he was maybe about eight years old, uh, they moved to Hall County, which is, Turkey, Texas is a town in Hall County that's widely known as his home. So everyone says, ah, oh, home of Bob Wills, home of Bob Wills. So he spent a lot of time there and also in Fort Worth because he met Milton Brown in 1930 in Fort Worth. So this is when they were having the jam session. They played the St. Louis Blues, which we heard a little earlier, um, and decided to form, um, well, they were part of the Light Crust Doughboys. So he left the Brownies. He decided, all right, I'm, I'm done. He headed off to Tulsa. He was going to form the Texas Playboys. And there he put together his dream band. Now, Bob, you'll hear that there are some differences there. Um, he, I like to call Tommy Duncan and Bob Wills the dream team. I love Tommy Duncan's voice, and we'll get to hear a little bit of it. But he had a little, in my opinion, kind of a more of a romantic way of playing. And they did a lot of beautiful ballads that they would swing. And, um, and a little bit of romance there compared to Milton Brown's kind of, in my opinion, just a really wild kind of sound with Bob Dunn. Uh, so Bob sort of romanticized it all. Um, and let's see. Oh, we got to hear them. We got to hear Tommy Duncan. OK. OK, you all have done your job. OK, here's a song that you may have heard. All gather round, friends, why hurt? All sailors walk. You ought to see my blue-eyed Sally. She lives way down on Chinbone Alley. The number on the gate, the number on the door, and the next house over at the grocery store. Stay all night, stay a little longer, dance all night. Dance a little longer, pull off the clothes, throw it in the corner, don't see why you don't stay a little longer. Al Strickland. That's awesome. <laughs> All right. Okay. So you could probably hear Bob in there. Yeah. So he kind of had a really signature way of doing these calls. Um, he he was known for his oh, oh 
So he would just kind of be over the recordings like a little bird <laughs> contributing his part. So I was talking about how I've always thought of Bob Wills and Tommy Duncan sort of making the music very romantic. And I think Tommy just has this velvety voice. like a crooner. All right. So Bob Wills was dubbed the king of Western swing. We, we think of Milton as the father of Western swing. He sort of uh, had all these really, this early growth and these early influences. And then Bob became the king. Um, Milton, of course, had a very short career like we talked about. He was very heavily influenced by African American blues and jazz musicians. So growing up, he was working in, in cotton fields and he was working alongside um, African-American workers and and was friends with all of them and was learning from them and um, I love this story he one time said that he rode on horseback 35 miles to go hear Bessie Smith so he loved blues singers he loved jazz musicians he was known to have hired African-American musicians in a time of racism and segregation and he he didn't care he was he's like this is a good person this is a good musician I like you know, I'm going to play with them. So he was um, very much a, a, a colorblind person, and he just loved the music. Um, he did. He was a huge part of defining what we think of as the Western swing sound today. So if any of you have heard uh, "Asleep at the Wheel" or a lot of the more modern bands doing Western swing, also very heavily influenced by Bob Will's sound. He at one point in the 40s and 50s has had added an entire horn section to his band so he was again experimenting later on and it pulled it away from sort of the just traditional fiddle band or string music sounds um he also appeared in 19 films so i did i didn't want to go through the whole clip but wanted to be able to let you guys see a little bit of what i'm talking about Stranger, I hope there's no danger. You think I'm getting off of my range? Oh, but I calculate that you're from my state, and though you may think it's strange, I allow us how you're from Texas. You talk the lingo, I understand. I'll bet my tail that you hail from Texas, cause there's no mistake in the brand. You've got a smile like an acre of sunflowers, and your eyes are a blue bonnet blue. Shake hands, it's grand, you're from Texas, cause I'm from Texas too. You know, that, that might actually be, Mike, do you know that? Did Bob ever sing lead on a recording? Yeah, he does. Uh, because shared some leads, because that's what, right. As like a whole, th right, right. He so yes and no. He did some shared shared vocals. Yeah. Okay. So some of those key musicians again. Tommy Duncan uh, was a vocalist that really helped define his sound early on. Um, Johnny Lee Wills, um, Leon McAuliffe on the steel guitar also contributed vocals to the band. 
Of course, you heard Al Strickland on the piano, and again, just the piano now becoming a staple as a rhythm section of Western Swing at that point, and Smokey Dacus on the drums. So there was kind of a funny little Nashville encounter I wanted to talk about. In 1944, the Grand Ole Opry had very strict rules that drums were not allowed. You could not have drummers on the Grand Ole Opry, and Bob Wills just loaded in his drummer like it was nothing, and they and performed, and he's, you know, it's maybe a little disputed, but he's the first to have had drums on the Opry, maybe, maybe not, but that was definitely a no-no back at that time, and he did not care. <laughs> so one really um, important recording was his last one. So I'm jumping a little ahead to the 70s, but this um, recording here was the last time that he ever recorded, and it was produced by Tommy Alsop and released in 1974. So that's a really wonderful thing for your collection if you are interested in Western Swing and would like to hear some of his later years. All right, getting into a little about Spade Cooley. So Spade Cooley was one of the first Western Swing artists I heard, and I loved his band because he had an accordion in it. He had some incredible accordion players. I particularly loved Pedro de Paul. But um, yeah, you can see the accordions right here. So this, gosh, what a great photo. That spade right in the center, sitting above that really lovely lady. I'm not sure who she is, but you can see Tex Williams over there holding a bass to the right. Spade right front and center. He was born in Oklahoma, and he was really part of the West Coast sound. He had moved to California, and you'll hear a little bit of a difference uh, when I pop, pop on that 78, but he had a very refined sound. Um, he was classically trained on the violin, so you'll, we'll, we'll see if we can kind of pick that apart here in a minute. He once beat Bob Wills in a battle of the bands and decided that he was the king of Western swing. <laughs> if you gotta tell people you are, then you are, Spade. <laughs> All right. Okay, so let's give him a little listen so we can see what's happening here. Okay. <laughs> the kick drum. <laughs> okay, listen to these fiddle parts behind here. Oh, there's accordion, sorry. So you can probably hear it's definitely got a huge orchestral sound in his band. Very refined, very um, classically inspired fiddle parts. So he was really bringing something new to the scene as well. He even had a harp in his band. And you can hear it, it often starts a song, it's like <laughs> But he was using a harp like a rhythm, you know, part of the rhythm section and it was really innovative. Um, 
the rhythm was also a little bit different. So you had in Texas and Oklahoma and in the South, you had a little bit of a low beer kind of swing. And this was that West Coast swing. It's a little snappier, a little bit more kind of right on the beat and not so behind it, not as much of the sort of jazz, blues influence there. So he was coming along and doing his own thing. He was also um, in the movies. <laughs> Hollywood's Western swing star, Old Spade. He was also a stand-in for Roy Rogers. So he looked a little bit like Roy. And um, there are several films where he was standing in for him. And then there's a few of the films that he was in. OK. Unfortunately, Spade Cooley made some poor life decisions. <laughs> um, he had a tragic, tragic uh, way of going out, but one of the most fascinating, be beautifully sad and also fascinating, but he had given um, an he was given an opportunity to perform while he was in prison and walked off stage and passed away. So it was a pretty wild story. Um, he was known to have a temper, so it's, <laughs> I don't like to get too, too much into it, but it's just such a, a huge part of his story that it's, it's worth a mention that he, um, he did have a, a very sad way of ending things. What's up? I didn't do any interview, but... Oh, is it? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I thought it was your guitar. I'm sorry about that. How old was he in prison at that point? He, you know, I want to say, oh my goodness. I wish I knew. Do you know this off the top of your head? I think he was in his 50s. Okay, because I, oh, no, no, no. I had thought he was a little older. Oh, he was 58. Mm -hmm. Hard life, right. <laughs> he did have a hard life. Made it hard, I'm sure. OK. Um, all right, so first off, I would like to invite my brother, Glenn McLaughlin, to the stage. And then we'll get to some questions. Hi, Hi. Glenn. Hi. Thank you for having me. Nice <laughs> sure. to see everybody. OK. Do you want to, um, real quick, just tell the folks kind of how you got into Western Swing? Uh, well, how you got me into Western Swing. I knew a, I knew a little bit of uh, guitar music. Uh, I knew three chords. And I was uh, focused on uh, other things in music. I played some piano and drums coming up. But uh, Ginny had a gig coming up in Arizona. And uh, she had a little trio with a fiddle and a bass at the time. And the bass player had to back out for work reasons a couple weeks before the gig. And Ginny turned to me and said, hey, you play a little guitar. I'm going to teach you how to do something. <laughs> and she taught me enough material to cover that gig, and the rest was history. I got I got into it, and um, yeah, and I took some lessons along the way. I went to college for a little bit at North Texas, and uh, studied some music there. And uh, most of what I've learned has been picked up along the way from some greats, and uh, you know anybody I can soak up info from. Uh, so, um, and that being said, um, I'd like to do a little bit of teaching myself. Uh, teach teach Western swing or, or guitar or, you know, who, whoever's interested in whatever learning styles of music. So uh, tell us about the camp. What, oh, yeah. And actually, I am wearing the T-shirt underneath this. But Jenny and I are going to be wearing, uh, teaching at a music camp. I've been there for a little while now, and I've been director the last couple of years in Truscott, Texas, the Circle Bar Ranch Music Camp. And it's focused on Western swing. This was actually has a lineage uh, back from when Tommy Alsup and Bobby Boatwright were running the camp. Uh, back in Oklahoma and uh, in West Texas as well. And the camp had a hiatus for a little bit. And Mr. J.W. Salas, a good proprietor of Western Swing, got it started back up again. And he brought me on and uh, I've been involved ever since. Um, so what we like to teach there is a focus on Western Swing and all the, um, all the kind of different styles of music that culminated into that. When, when we started that, uh, Johnny Boatwright, who is Bobby Boatwright's brother, uh, came and talked to everybody, and he said, you know, my brother used to always say, Western Swing is like, takes a little bit of jazz, and it takes a little bit, it's like jazz on cornbread. And uh, <laughs> I think, yeah, because it, it really was kind of that, uh, you know, that's the vibe that we all kind of take from it, is it's got some, some grassroots, some Ozark Mountain, Nashville kind of music, Tennessee music, and then it's got some jazz, 
and it's got some big band elements to it, and I think culminated all into one uh, gives it kind of that wild yet polished sound. So uh, without, yeah, uh, I, I just like to actually talk a little bit <laughs> about some of the, um, the elements that I, I like to incorporate into the guitar side of things. Uh, Eldon Shamblin being the, the, the big voice of guitar uh, coming out of the Bob Wills Western swing music. Um, and what he was kind of focusing on, I think a lot of the focus was, and I wasn't there, but uh, from what I hear, a lot of the focus was trying to incorporate a lot of the elements that maybe were taken minimally from jazz music or taken minimally from kind of bluegrass styles and making it a bigger sound from the kind of jazz uh, big band era. And uh, I guess what I mean by that is you have kind of some guitar players who might uh, in, in jazz music, we'll, we'll play more minimal styles of chords. Whereas in Western Swing, they're kind of trying to blend with maybe the bassist and also trying to give some rhythm that the drummer might be. And it, it's, you know, whether they're working in small combinations or a big band, I think they can all kind of fill that gap. And I think that's one of the, one of the big characteristics of improvisation that uh, is taken from a lot of these styles of music. So, so the guitarist, in my role, I've tried to fill some of the bass lines without stepping on the bassist because, you know, the bassists don't like it when you play what they're playing. <laughs> it just so if the bass player, if we're playing kind of a blues, you know, that's kind of a, a, a nice, blues pattern where the basis is going to be so as a guitarist I'm trying to kind of counteract a little bit playing a little counterpart with some of those uh, and the kind of mixing in chords so I'm not you know it's it's it, to the ear, it's, it becomes more obvious that I'm not imitating a basis, but I am counteracting, so or playing a counterpart to it to, to make, you know, musical. So if you're playing an upbeat Western swing tune, Shamblin's guitar playing, and, and the bassist doesn't have, you know. You know, they're not really stepping on each other. So that's what I take away from some of the musical stylings uh, that I try to bring in. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> would you like to do a song together? Like what would you like to do? Uh, how about a little uh, trouble in mind? All right. All right, so yeah. Uh, this is uh, one of my favorite Bob Wills tunes, and uh, was this a Tommy Duncan uh, vocal yeah. with the band? Yeah. yeah. All right, so kick it off there. One, three. Oh, my God. 
awesome. <laughs> Thank you so much. Does anyone have any questions so far? I wanted to make sure if there were questions for Glenn or for about the presentation that we got those in. Y'all good? Okay, cool. <laughs> you want to play something? All right. Okay. We're gonna play another song and then we'll pretty much conclude today. I do have some fun things up here like books and records if anybody wanted to just walk by and look at anything. I like to bring a few little points of interest, but other than that, thank you so much for being here. I just want to say that. Appreciate you. <laughs> All right, what you got? Oh, do you wanna do Spade Cooley? Yeah, what you got? Okay, doing? let's do You Can't Break My Heart. I love that one. Okay. <laughs> You can't break my heart, it's been broken before, been broken by someone just like you. His eyes used to shine when they looked into mine, but dimmed when he found someone new. If you only knew the trouble I've been through, then I guess you'd understand that you can't break my heart. It's been broken before, been broken by someone just like you. Dancers say that they a lot a lot of times they're listening to the bass over the drums. So whatever that means. <laughs> <laughs> that, that meant a lot to me when somebody said it. So I try to the always feel the correlation. The bass over everything else. <laughs> exactly, right? Yeah. Really easy guitars. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you all so much. I appreciate you being here. <laughs> Join us next week. We'll go forward on. <laughs>